It's pretty amazing how uh, New Heart just continue to have this many graduates every year. And uh, I don't know about you, but looking at the number of people here, having 20 graduates, uh, I think it's a little bit, you know, it's a blessing. It really is. And, uh, you know, my daughter graduated too. And what an amazing uh, blessing that is as a parent, as a family, right? Uh, it's years of parents just pouring their lives. And I really want to honor the parents and their love and sacrifice. Without it, I don't think something like today is possible. So I just want to praise the Lord and thank the parents uh, for all that uh, love and accomplishment that you have poured upon your children. Today, uh, I want to talk about grace, okay? And there's a famous book title, What is So Amazing About Grace? Philip Yancey. I don't know whether you heard of the book. It's a great book, okay? Can I just ask you, and you could answer to yourself, is grace amazing to you? Just asking, and I need to ask this question, okay? Is grace amazing to you? You know, uh, I was preparing this morning. I came across, and I remember this old song, great song. And I put it on Kakao for Next Gen Ministry, so you can listen to it after, after the service. Okay, let me just read it to you. See what uh, this author is saying. Why have you chosen me out of millions? It's pretty much billions now. Why have you chosen me out of millions? Your child to be. You know all the wrongs that I have done. Oh, how could you pardon me, forgive my iniquities, to save me, give Jesus your son. See where he is, right? Okay, and the chorus part, this is the second verse. But Lord, help me. Okay, this person wants to respond to that grace. Lord, help me to be what you want me to be. Your word I will strive to obey. My life I now give. For you I will live and walk by your side all the way. It's, this is Christianity, brothers and sisters. This is Christianity. Second verse. Here's the word amazing, okay? I'm amazed to know that God so great could love me so. We talked about God last night in Next Gen Ministry. That great God loved me so, right? Remember that adverb? So He's willing and wanting to bless. His love is so wonderful. His mercy is so bountiful. I can understand. I confess. I can never understand. Okay? I don't know. I, I, I remember this song. I Googled it. I love Google. And then it pops right up. And then I got the lyrics. It's a great song, okay? Why have you chosen me out of billions? Can I talk about choosing of God? In your choosing of friends, in our choosing of a acquaintance, someone that you want to do something, how do you choose? Right? How do we choose? Normally, we choose whatever is to my taste, what I desire, what is beneficial to me, what is cool, basically. That's how we choose, right? But God's choosing is a little unconventional, if you, if you think about it, to say the least. Okay? Out of million years, million people, billion people, God chooses. Today, we're going to talk about soul, okay? Very significant story. In the Bible period, uh, definitely in the book of Acts, okay? We talked about chapter 8, we talked about chapter 10. I intentionally left chapter 9 out so that I could talk about it today, actually, after thinking about before and after. What follows after, what, what, what comes before. Today we want to talk about story of a one person, right? God choosing him out of millions, okay? How does he do that? What's, his, what's the criteria? 
And my question to you, a further question is, when does he choose? How long do we go back? Well, I'm 50-some years old, so he chosen me 50-some years ago, right? No, no. It goes back way beyond. But here's a more crazy thing to think about. To God, there is no yesterday, today, and, and, and tomorrow. He is transcendent. Therefore, He already is there. He already sees. And He chooses. Does that make sense? Right? You know, we normally say, let me see how you do, okay? I'll think about it, see how you re, uh, respond. We say, you know, let me see how you respond, and I'll, I'll, I'll think about how to respond to that. Well, God already seen how you do, and God has chosen. That's pretty, pretty amazing, okay? Um, uh, we all know the song uh, Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, okay? For those of you do, who do not know, John Newton was a slave trader. He was a bad guy. He was just just crazy guy, okay? And this is what is written in his tombstone, written by himself. Check this out, okay? He's an Englishman, okay? John Newton, he wrote a clerk, one son infidel and libertine, comma, a servant of slaves, slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned and appointed to preach the faith that he had long labor to destroy. That's written, that's the epitaph that's written on his tombstone. Isn't that great? Right? John Newton, a clerk. I'm not that important person and I was an infidel. Right? I wasn't even a believer. Right? I was, in fact, someone who opposes it and libertine. He lived a wild life. Once he was a slave trader, but if you read his bi biography, he becomes a slave himself. I don't know how it ha happened. 16th century, 17th century, right? He became a slave himself in a ship and basically live as a slave. And if you read his uh, biography, someone feed him, not on a plate, but on the floor. Just throw the food on the floor. And he licks the food like a dog. Right? And he remembered the praises and songs and the word that he grew up with. As he was reading the uh, Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis, his life was completely transformed. And he wrote the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that save a wretch like me. Do you see it? You have to see it, okay? So today I want to talk about Saul's story, one person's story, but such a representative story. I personally believe you need to have an Acts chapter 9 of your life, and I need to have one too. Conversion story. But this is a person who's so undeserving. If you want to use that word, so contra-deserving, okay? So unconventional. He's choosing. God's choosing is very different than us. We choose cool people. We choose beneficial people. We choose uh, someone who will benefit me. But God chooses, you'll see, someone who is so unworthy. Okay? Story of uh, soul, story of grace, amazing. Okay? So let me read it to you one more time. I know Jonah uh, read it, but let me just read it to you. But soul still breathing threats and murder. So he's a violent, vicious guy, okay, against the disciples of Jesus. Okay, do you, do you see it? Very, very beginning of his story, he is not just a neutral person, but he was a, a vehemently, adamantly an enemy of Jesus himself. Went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if, if he bound any belonging, uh, belong to the uh, way, which means Jesus, men or women, I think this is added just to see, uh, just tell us what kind of state he was in. He doesn't care whether men or women, 
He doesn't care children or elderly. He doesn't care. He just wants to capture them, bring them to Jerusalem, and they will be stoned to death. He wanted to kill them, exterminate them, basically. That's the kind of state he was. And he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, he went on his way. This is one day of his life. Okay, with that introduction, he was on his way. He approached a city called Damascus. And suddenly, a light from heaven shone around him. A light, not lightning. He should be zapped and be gone. God could do that, you know. And he so have a right to do that and capacity to do that. But instead of doing that, to shine light from heaven around him, and falling to the ground. So Saul fell to the ground from, from the horse. You see him? This is Saul. Okay. And he heard a voice saying to him, this is Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I don't know what you see, what you hear. I don't know what you sense, but God of the universe, resurrected King of King, comes to him in such weakness. Why are you beating me up? Why are you persecuting me? So not right. And then he said, Who are you, Lord? So, and then Jesus said, I am Jesus, resurrected Jesus, King of kings, whom you are persecuting. Okay, which means enemy, right? So enemy should be just get rid of and killed. And, and, and Jesus knew. But, Rise and enter the city, and you will be told what, you are, uh, what to do. The men who are traveling with, with him, the people around him, stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. See, he was with other people. They hear the voice, but seeing no one, right? But Saul rose uh, from the ground, and although, here's a line that I want to share with you. His eyes were opened, but he saw nothing. Okay, Scripture speaks about this. His eyes were open just like yours and mine. Does it look like my eyes are open? My eyes aren't, my eyes aren't that big, so, you know. Is it, does it look, do they look like they're open? They're open. The Bible is saying, but see nothing. Do you see anything? Do you care? The Bible speaks about this. Your eyes are open, but you see nothing. Okay? Now, here's the thing. This is after meeting the resurrected Jesus. Did he see before? Probably not. So what I see is when I meditate about this story is that when he met Jesus, he realized that he was blind. Which means before you meet Jesus, you don't even know you're blind. Isn't that kind of sad? Right? But that's the scriptural truth. Okay? So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Okay? Verse 10, completely different, a different person, person named Ananias. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. You know, God always prepares one person who needs to receive grace, and God always prepares another person to be the agent of grace. I don't know why he does that. Don't you think here God could have done it by himself? If you think about it, is God not capable of pouring grace upon this man? He can't do it by himself. Think with me. He is. But why does he choose someone like Ananias, someone like Philip, someone like uh, Simon, and someone like me or you? You know, we're going to evangelism uh, this afternoon. We'll be, going to, we'll be going to Cunningham Park. And I look so forward to it. I, I look forward to it. Uh, we had a great time a couple weeks ago when we went to Ellie Pond Park. I met a family, and I spent an hour and a half just talking to them, getting to know them, have coffee, have tiramisu uh, cake. Had a great time, okay? And here's, here's what I'm thinking. Perhaps God has already prepared a person there. He's probably getting up, taking a shower right now, Okay? And he's going to, oh, yeah, let's pack up and go to Cunningham Park. Come on, people, right? So he could have done it by himself, but he chooses to use someone like Ananias. And let's, let's look at this story, okay? See how he responded. 
Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And then the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. Very specific. God is very detailed. We talked about this last night in Next Year Ministry. God is so great and yet so detailed. Right? Go to the street at the house of Judah, someone's, someone's house. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. He, he even tells Ananias what he's doing right now. Right? And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. That's him. Right? Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Do you see crazy thing happening? God is telling Ananias, he's dreaming about you, that you'll be coming in and laying your hands upon him and his eyes will be opened. That's how specific he is. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? But Ananias answered, no, Lord. Lord, I've heard about this guy from many how much evil. He's an evil guy. You know, he has done to your people at Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But here's the crazy part. Would you wake up? Okay, here's the crazy part. Basically, Ananias said, no, he's a bad guy. He's, a, he's, a, he's an evil guy. And here is what God, Jesus, speak to Ananias. But the Lord, Jesus, said to him, Go! He is my chosen instrument. That's his choosing. That's his choosing. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. This is pretty amazing. Is God stupid? No, he's not stupid. Is God not logical? No, he's pretty logical. But that's his choosing. Out of millions. Did he not have enough people to choose from? A Pharisee, a smart guy. He ran out of smart people. That's why he chose someone like Saul? No. Right? Is my chosen instrument... If we just stop here, I, I think that's pretty amazing, but it does not stop there. To carry my name to the Gentiles. And that's why I waited this story to today. Because last two weeks we talked about how historical that is, the gospel to go, from, to go forth from Jews to Gentiles. And God chose this man for that historic moment of Christian history. Do you hear it? I don't know what your passion and goal is after the graduation. Seriously. I don't know what your goal is. You go to medical school, law school, uh, you know, business school, whatever. I don't know what your passion is. But the greatest thing, I could state it right now, I've stated it right now. If God is real, is to be used by Him for His eternal purpose. Otherwise, your, your life is pretty much wasted. That's pretty much what it is, okay? To the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name, okay? I love this story, okay? So what does Ananias do? Ananias obeyed right away. He departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, that blesses my heart. Can I just ask you, is Saul his brother already? No, no, think with me. It is Saul, brother of Ananias. He was his enemy. But God said, no, I have chosen him. And he, go, he goes to over, to, over to Saul, brother Saul. Isn't that how we should go to Cunningham Park and evangelism? Really believing? Brother Saul. Brother Saul, Lord Jesus, appear to you on the road by you, which, which you has sent me. He sent me. You know, here's the crazy thing. Jesus could have done it by himself, but why does he choose Ananias and send me? That's a really, really a good question. Can he not do it by himself? Yes, he can. But he chooses to use reluctant disciples like Ananias, like Simon Peter, and like you and me. 
that you may regain the sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I really ask you to look at this. They go together. That you may be able to see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? We just sang it today, right? Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. What do we see? The beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of our life spent with you. That's Christianity, isn't it? Do you see? Do you see his beauty? Do you have that hope of, of, of life spent with him? How do you respond? So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. You know what you worship? What you love in your heart. Worship is not sitting here. I mean, it is worship, but worship is what you love and treasure in your heart placing your entire life on the altar that's worship otherwise it's not worship you worship what you treasure until your eyes are opened by the spirit of god you do not worship because you're blind i'm saying this not to taunt you not to degrade you but say speak with the heart of shepherd really pray that god would open your eyes as he has done it to Saul. Hey, that's why I'm saying this. Okay, so what happened? So he rose and, oh, okay. You may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And look at this. It's, I think it's very intentional. Immediately, immediately, not 10 years later, like some of you believe, right? Immediately, something like scales fell off from his eyes and he regained his sight. He rose and he was baptized. In other words, right away he had identified with Christians, right? And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus. Immediately, guys, right? In the synagogues saying he is the son of God. You know what he's doing? He goes to the synagogue and tells Jesus is, is son of God. That means kill me, stone me. That's exactly what he was doing a day ago, three days ago. Now he's going to the synagogues and telling the Jews, right, Jesus is the Son of God, meaning he's ready to die. He identified with Christians. When your eyes are opened, you will identify with Christ. Until then, all kinds of coward answers, I think. Coward. Right? And all who heard him were amazed, is the word, amazed, said, is not this man who made havoc in Jerusalem and uh, of those who are called upon the name? And has, has he not come here for the purpose and bringing the bound, bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. I love this story. Acts 9. And today I want to really ask you, has Act 9 happened in your life? No, seriously, I really mean it. Let's not put around. I think we do that too much. Has Act 9 story happened in your life? I really want to ask that question. Okay, just one more page. When many days has passed, Jews wanted to kill him. Okay, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates, uh, gate day and night in order to kill him. But disciples took him 
by the night and let him down through the opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. You know, you learned it in Sunday school. What about the disciples? And when, he, uh, when Saul come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, Christians, and they were afraid of him. But they did not believe that he was a disciple. But here's a, a, another very important name, Barnabas. Remember last week, Acts chapter 11, it was Barnabas who brought Saul to church. Again, it was Barnabas. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord and spoke to them, how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went and in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So he went to his own, his own home time, hometown. And the uh, end of this uh, account, so the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was being built up, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Okay, that's the story. Saul, one person, one person. Please, don't check out right now. We're talking about you right now. We're talking about right now. God's choosing, and can I just ask you, what happens if He doesn't choose you? What happens? Does it matter? It definitely matters. So I want you to listen. Okay? Saul, what kind of man was he? He grew up in Tarsus, Tarsus near Antioch, uh, current Syria. He was a Hellenistic immigrant diaspora Jew. Second, third generation Jewish person living in Syria or Turkey. And he was a Roman citizen, okay? He had Roman citizen, like U.S. citizen. Probably his father was rich, right? Influential. And he grew up in a Hellenistic culture and education, meaning he had the best, best education. Probably American education comparable to. And then he came to Jerusalem. He was educated in Jerusalem as a Jew, studied the law and the Old Testament under a teacher named Gamaliel. That's Harvard uh, education to be a Pharisee, okay? So if you put those two together, he was pretty much the top of the tops, right? He was the top of the tops. He has, he has a Hellenistic educational and cultural background, American teaching, let's say. And then he went to Jerusalem. He studied the law, studied the Old Testament to be a Pharisee under Gamaliel. So he had everything, right? So he was really passionate about God and Jewish religion, Right? Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was being persecuted, stoned to death, you know, remember what he was doing? He was the Pharisee. People were taking their jackets off, put it in front of me, I'll take care of it. That was so pretty, uh, pretty embarrassing picture, right? Acts chapter 8, great persecution broke out from the city of Jerusalem, and this person was the mastermind. And he was the ringleader. He's the guy who brought fan the flame of the persecution. And I, I think about this. And out of all the people, God chooses him to be my instrument for the gospel to go forth to the Gentiles, which is a historical moment. Pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. Pretty crazy. Whichever you want to call it. Okay. He was zealous, and he loved God. Can I just, uh, just, uh, just go back and kind of have a review of uh, Acts? Acts chapter 7, a story of Stephen being killed, and Saul shows up. Acts chapter 8, people, as people were scattered, one of the deacons named Philip meets an African. Do you remember that? African shows up in Acts chapter 8. Ethiopian eunuch. Do you remember? It was both Holy Spirit who worked on both of them so they will have an encounter. The, the deacon, Philip, and Ethiopian eunuch. Chapter 9, which is next chapter, it was Saul and Ananias. 
Chapter 10 is Cornelius. He's a white person. He's an Italian, centurion, and Simon. Now, picture with me. One is African, one is Middle Eastern person, and one is white person. What's the common thing, though? The common thing we find in these three chapters, in these th three stories, is that God prepares the giver, and God prepares the one who needs to receive the grace on all three chapters. But what's, what's, what's interesting thing is, I think the focus is not on the giver, but on the receiver. Ethiopian eunuch was a God-fearer. He was reading the book of Isaiah, right? Chapter 10, Cornelius, a God-worshipper with his family, he was worshiping the Lord. So it's a pretty good stories. But what about chapter 9? Not like that. Undeserving. Undeserving. I just want to give you a few thoughts. Okay. Saul was a hater of Jesus. Please listen to me, okay? Because this is Christianity. He was a hater of Jesus. He wanted to kill anybody who followed Jesus, right? Vehemently, passionately hated Jesus and his followers. And yet, God has chosen him. And I'm continuing to ask you to think about God's choosing. Okay. Saul, who was passionate seeker of God, it's not that he was an atheist. He was really, really passionate seeker of Old Testament God, right? Messiah. Yet he was blind. Do you see it? Who did not know he was, he, he was blind. Do you know you're blind? If you have not met Jesus resurrected, Bible declares that you're blind. Perhaps you know you're blind, and then there is a chance that you do not know you're blind. I am not taunting you, please. I'm not. But I'm just stating this very important biblical truth. However, Jesus showed up, and he realized his eyes were open, but he saw nothing. Jesus, light of the world, stepped down into darkness, opened my eyes, and let me see. What did he see? The beauty of his mercy, beauty of his grace. Isn't that what he saw for the rest of his life and the rest of the book of Acts? Isn't that what he saw? Isn't that what he talked about? My life is worth nothing unless I finish the race, complete the task that God has given me, which is to testify the gospel of God's grace. Do you remember that? That's Christianity. When he met Jesus resurrected, his eyes were opened, just like John Newton sing about it in his, in his song, Amazing Grace. I was blind, but now I see. Can I just ask you, can you say that? I was blind, but now I see. Second thought is that Saul's story, as we talked about, unlike chapter 8, unlike chapter 10, okay, he really doesn't deserve it. It's the story of a pretty bad sinner saved by grace, and I would say grace alone. Don't you think? There's nothing that Paul, Saul did that deserves to be saved. Nothing that he deserves. If anything, he deserves opposite of salvation. He should be consumed and put to death right away. And yet, he was spared. Isn't that what this story is? Right? And Ananias didn't want to, say, uh, didn't want to go to him. And it was a logical response. Lord, he's a bad guy. He's killing all the Christians. Why should I go to him? You are greatly mistaken, Lord. Is God... Was God making a mistake? Does he ever make a mistake, is my question to you. Do you want to be chosen by God, or does it matter to you? Stay with me. I know it's hot. Okay, stay with me. Come on, people. Stay with me. Does it matter to you whether you are chosen, to, chosen by God or not? I hope it matters to you. 
more than anything, right? And then God says something that really sounds like God. He said, go. Ananias, shut up, go, right? For he is my chosen instrument. And I think about this. Can I just ask you, when did he choose him? I know I mentioned it. When did he choose him? 10 years ago? 15 years ago? 30 years ago? Long time ago. What did God see in Saul? Bad guy, right? Because he sees the future. In fact, to him, present and future is the same thing. He's transcendent God. Unlike us, we're a pretty linear person. We have, we have past and present and future, but to God, he is not. And yet, God has chosen him. God has chosen you. What did he see? He saw the beauty. That's what I believe. Because he saw Jesus in you, and he saw the beauty. It's probably hard for you to believe. That's why you need to believe. He saw the beauty. Of course he saw all the, all the sin. Of course he saw all the iniqu iniquities. Of course he saw all the uh, rebellion. Of course. But he saw the beauty through Jesus. That's what he saw. I really believe that, okay? God of grace has chosen someone who has the most decorated career as an enemy, lasting enemy of God's way. And to him, go. And he is my chosen instrument. Can I just ask you today, will go evangelism? You don't have to go today, but will you go? Will you go? I'm going to go. Unless God stops me, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with a belief that God may have or God prepared someone like Saul in the park. That's how I'm going to go. Seriously. Now, can I just ask you, if you do that, how would it affect your evangelism? Most people don't share Christ, and if they share, they always say, oh, people don't want to hear me. Isn't that what you think? Oh, people will have all these difficult questions, so I won't be able to answer. We are living in a such a, you know, uh, uh, pluralistic society, so we can't really push Christianity. That's what you're thinking. What about what the Scripture is saying? No, God has prepared someone for you to go and just... Open so that they, their eyes may be opened as they be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that a possibility? You better believe it. You better believe it. Okay? Lastly, what sounds so much like to carry on a mission for the king, right? Ananias carry on a mission, a message right? To an enemy of Christ. What do you call them? Ambassador. Ambassador. That's what the calling is, to be an ambassador for Christ with the message of reconciliation. I think conversion of Saul of Tarsus, Saul who was the arch enemy, to become the ambassadors to Gentiles. That's the grace of God, people. That's the grace of God. And I pray that you would understand it. Pray that you would know the grace of God. Love of God. He's different than us. Aren't you glad? We pick smart people. We pick cool people. We, we pick good-looking people. But God has chosen you. He's different. And me. And to me... There's nothing greater than that. Nothing greater. You know, last night, uh, five of us sitting uh, in the hallway after talking about Gospel by John chapter 316, we tried to learn how to share the Gospel. Do you know how to share the Gospel? You should learn. Right? 
And we were talking about God. And one of the questions we raised is, what does life look like in your age, in your peers? What does life look like without God? Can you think about that? Your peers, your friends, what does life look like without God's presence? Among other important things, one sister shared, which really blessed my heart. She's a young, young sister working, and she said, it's like a life swimming in the sea, but there is no end. Isn't that what it looked like? You're, I'm talking about your peers. Whether you're in your 20s or 30s or teens, doesn't matter. Life without God. It's like you're swimming in the sea and there is no end. It's dead end. Why have you chosen me out of millions? Why have you pardoned me? Why have you given me a heart to carry out your work? Let's pray.